Hoffa. And I wanted to start to by respectfully acknowledging that I, along with um, our institution, PAFA, um, am speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the, of the Lene Lenape people, whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. We'd like to take this opportunity to honor the original caretakers of this land and recognize the histories that have brought our institution and ourselves here this evening. And before I hand things over to the woman of the hour, I did want to mention just a couple things. We are recording tonight's event and um, it will be posted later this evening. I've already gotten quite a few folks from around the world who weren't able to make it with us who'd like to see their recording. So that will be up on Papa's YouTube channel um, at the end of the evening. And um, so I'll share that link in just a second. We also, I, if you notice, I have muted folks. Um, that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. So please feel free to drop things in the chat as we go. It's wonderful to see all of these. Congratulations to our, our author of the hour. Um, if you have questions, please drop them in. Resources, I know we have a wonderful crowd here with us with lots of different perspectives. So note that we will have time at the end where we'll be able to read those, but you can drop them in as we go. We have some exciting programs happening at PAFA this month. I wanted to make sure to include. Um, we'll be dropping a link to our events calendar where you can see it's regularly updated. We have another event this week that I wanted to make sure folks know about that's tied to our Joan Simmel Skin in the Game exhibition that just opened. So this Thursday, our curator of contemporary art, Jody Throckmorton, and scholar and catalog writer, Rachel Middleman, Middleman will be discussing Simmel's work and the intersections of aging, feminism, and art. It's totally free. It will be around the same time that we are meeting tonight. So if you're free, we'd love to have you join us for that event. So now I'm proud to introduce the woman behind this event and our moderator, Judith Brodsky. Judith Brodsky is a distinguished professor emerita in the Department of Art and Design at the Mason Gross School of Arts at Rutgers University. She's the founding director of the Brodsky Center, which was established in 1986 at Rutgers University, which joined PAFA in 2018. Its mission is to educate students and develop and promote the work of outstanding and innovative artists centering around women and BIPOC artists. Her new book is Dismantling the Patriarchy Bit by Bit, Art, Feminism, and D Digital Technology, which was published by Bloomsbury Art and Culture in October, 2021. Um, this is one of the first books to connect feminist theory with the rise of digital art. We are so excited to be celebrating the release of Judy's book tonight, and I will now hand it over to you, Judy. So you are muted, so I'm going to ask if you don't mind. I'm asking to unmute. So you're still muted. It should be at the bottom of your screen. That little, there we yeah, go. I think I have it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Can everyone hear me now? Mm -hmm. I, I assume so. Okay. So Abby, thank you so much. And, and thank you to everyone who has tuned in. And I also want to thank the artists who are participating tonight and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts for mounting this book launch. I want to start by telling you a little bit about why I wrote the book. My goal is to restore women artists, particularly those working with feminist concepts, to the history of digital art and to show that they are particularly important to our contemporary culture and society because they are working in ways that have the potential to transform technology itself. The transformation of technology into a more positive construct is of course a very hot topic today with the controversy around Facebook and other social network platforms. Women artists are moving digital technology away from its patriarchal identity as a tool of the government, the military and the corporate world and changing it into a technology that can empower women, black, indigenous and other people of color as well as non-binary individuals. It is this exciting leading edge art that I document in my book. As much as digital technology has become part of our daily lives and is taken for granted, we still don't tend to think of art as being digitally driven. But today, digital technology pervades even traditional painting and sculpture so much that it is embedded in our contemporary art, 
rhizomatically with its tentacles reaching everywhere. So I also wanted to give digital artists their due as being among the most significant artists working today and remedy the fact that they are not appreciated to the extent they deserve. That's why I'm pleased that so many of you have tuned in tonight because one of my goals is to educate the general public as well as art historians to the tremendous contributions that artists who use digital technology are making to our culture. The art history survey books are mostly still focused on the traditional forms of art making that have existed for eons, but it is digital artists who are shaping the future of art. I chose five artists from the hundred or so I discuss in the book to join me tonight for this conversation. Five whom I think will give you a sense of the exciting and varied work being made by women identified and trans artists using digital technology. They will then present their work and we will conclude with an informal conversation about art using digital technology and its intersection with race, gender, and power. If we have time, we will take questions from the audience as well. Since the 19th, now I'm going, what I'm gonna do now is introduce uh, the artists all at once, and then we'll move to the artist talks and each one will just follow upon the other. So I'm just gonna introduce them all at the same time. Since the 1970s, Lynn Hirschman Leeson has been internationally acclaimed for her art and films. Over the last 50 years, she has made pioneering contributions to the fields of photography, video, film, performance, artificial intelligence, bio art, installation, and interactive as well as net-based art. There she is. She is a recipient of a SIGGRAPH Lifetime Achievement Award, a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship and many other awards. Her six feature films were screened at the Sundance Film Festival, the Toronto Film Festival, and the Berlin International Film Festival, among others. She was awarded a Sloan Foundation Prize, Prize for Writing and Directing, and her film, Women Art Revolution, received the grand prize at the Festival of Films on Art. Her art is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art and many other museums globally, in addition to many private collections. A retrospective of her work, Lynn Hirschman Leeson, Twisted, was held at the New Museum this past year. Born and raised in the United States, could I have the next one, please? Next slide, uh, here she is. Born and raised in the United States, but now living in Munich, Germany, Tamako Thiel is a graduate of Stanford University and has a master's degree in mechanical engineering from MIT, where she studied machine, human machine design and computer graphics. She also holds a diploma in applied graphics from the Academy of Fine Arts in Munich, Germany. Thiel's first career was in product design, working at corporations like Hewlett Packard and Worlds Incorporated, where she worked closely with Steven Spielberg to create Starbright World, an online interactive 3D virtual world for seriously ill children. Her work is included in various permanent museum collections, including the Museum of Modern Art. Most recently, she is one of five artists commissioned by the Smithsonian Institution to create artwork in celebration of the Smithsonian's 107th anniversary. She is also one of the pioneer artists in exploring the possibilities in NFTs, which I'll talk about later. And one of her NFTs for an augmented reality installation was sold in Christie's groundbreaking NFT auction last spring. Terry T. Tao is a New Zealand artist and writer. Her practice explores Maori knowledge systems, science, and speculative fiction. She completed a PhD in creative arts from Massey University in 2015 and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Cultural Centered Approach to Research Center at Massey University. She's a member of the Mata Aho Collective, recent winners of the Walters Art Prize. In 2017, the collective represented New Zealand at Documenta, the first time New Zealand artists had been invited to present their work at the event. The Mata Aho Collective has also exhibited at the National Gallery of Canada, the Honolulu 
um, Biennial, the Musée de Quay Branly Paris, and the Royal Academy London, as well as museums through throughout New Zealand. And I hope I pronounced it correctly, but if not, then uh, Terry will correct me later. Within her personal practice, she has exhibited at home and abroad, including Denmark, Canada, and New York. In her installations, she juxtaposes the Maori worldview against state-sanctioned surveillance of citizens, showing how Maori philosophy and values help her community to develop resistance and how it can mitigate systemic prejudice. Stephanie Dinkins is a transdisciplinary American artist based in Brooklyn, New York. She's known for creating art about artificial intelligence as it intersects race, gender, and history. Dinkins received an MFA in photography from the Maryland Institute College of Art and also is a graduate of the independent study program at the Whitney Museum of American Art. She is the Kusama Professor of Art History of Art, excuse me, at Stony Brook University. Her recent work is a series of conversations between Dinkins and Bina 48, the first artificially intelligent humanoid robot who looks like a black woman. In a previous project, she created a series of artificial intelligence talking heads who tell stories based on the history of Dinkins' own family. Her work has been exhibited in both the US and abroad at venues such as the Whitney Museum, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the de Young Museum, the Barbican Museum London, and the Kunst Museum in Herning, Denmark. In addition to her own artwork, Dinkins is an activist who has organized workshops to educate communities of color to understand the algorithms of big data and how artificial intelligence works. Mimi um, uh, uh, Onuora is a Nigerian American artist whose work highlights the social relations and power dynamics behind data collection. Her multimedia practice uses print, code, installation, and video to call attention to the ways in which people in the margins are mixed, uh, are missed, excuse me, are missed by socio-technical data systems. Onuoha has been in residence at IBEAM uh, in New York, the Data and Society Research Institute at Columbia University and the Royal College of Art London. Her exhibition and speaking credits include venues ranging from locations in China to the Pompidou Center in Paris and locations in the United States from New York City to San Francisco. In 2014, she was selected to be in the inaugural class of Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellows. And in 2017, she was nominated as a Technical Brooklyn Artist of the Year. Onuoha holds a master's degree from New York University's Tisch School. Uh, she has held fellowships at the Olin College for Engineering and Princeton University, among others, as well as serving as a visiting arts professor at Tisch. So now I'm going to turn this over to the artists who each will present uh, their, their each will present her own work. Lynn. I'm turning it over to you. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, exactly at three o'clock, my internet went off in my apartment. None of my computers are, <laughs> are working, but thankfully I've got my cell phone. So that's where I'm talking from. So this piece I did got me in a lot of trouble. This was done in 1966 and it was called Self portrait as another person. It was in the height, height of the civil rights movement. And this used sensors and sound. And I put it in an exhibition that was then closed down because I was told that it wasn't art and sound and media didn't belong in an art museum. It took me almost 60 years to show the piece, actually, when I found out in 19, uh, I mean, in 2000 and 14, that it was the first work that ever did use sound, which is why it um, it caused so much trouble when I first did it. So, but it but it really the the failure of this piece uh, to be shown was really what reshaped the work that I did from then on. Uh, then on. So let's go to the next one. Can we see the next 
Yeah. So and this is called Roberta Brightmore. And this was about a woman who lived for almost 10 years in the Bay Area. And she was really a, a mirror of her culture. And she reflected and refracted uh, what it was like to be a woman at that particular time. So she saw a psychiatrist, had a checking account, had credit cards, um, and, and really uh, became a participant in the in the life that she was leading but then was you were able to document uh she was documented with almost 300 works and you you as you look through these pieces later are able to reperform her through the various works that she did if i were to have done this work 10 years later it would have been identity theft but this was pre-computer so i was able to get away with it so rather than it being a static photograph it really was a lived experience that, where she ran into a lot of risks, like being asked to join a prostitution ring that was also documented. Uh, let's go to the next one. This is called Lorna. This happened after Roberta's uh, foray into the real world. In this piece, it is considered one of the first interactive laser disc pieces. And it went from 1978 to 1982 is when it was being made. And in this piece, you, you sit in a chair and use your remote switch to remotely access different adventures that the character could have had. Um, and there are various soundtracks you could use and you essentially become a virtual character in the control of the agoraphobic woman Woman that you're trying to understand. Next one. This is Agent Ruby. This was the very first AI chatbot, uh, humanoid, humanoid ro robot that went with a film I did called Technolust that was about a, a, a woman who cloned herself three times. And one of the clones had a, a portal where she, a Lonely Hearts portal. So the way this worked actually, when the film was shown, this would download onto Palm Pilots so that you could actually talk to Ruby after you left the theater. Um, so, but of course everything has to be migrated because uh, the lifespan of technology is, uh, is so short. Um, it, let's go to the next one. Uh, I, I started to, to think about what was happening in in the last 10 years that really was significant. And I realized that it was really the programming of the genome. And so I began to research uh, what that meant and what was happening. These are really all about identity pieces from the very first through to this, this one. And this is part of a wallpaper that I have of all the thousands of species that have never existed before that are now papering and wallpapering our planet. I think that this is a jellyfish feline and it was made by Mayo Clinic to uh, test the, the AIDS virus and to try to uh, locate a cure for it. Next. There's one more, I think. Yeah. Oh, this this is one that I did after I made a, a genetics lab in from 2014 on. And I put all of my research for that lab together and was able to, in this mirror box that is behind a lab door, on one side, I have all of the research that I did uh, that was converted into DNA itself that's on the left side, it was done by Twist Biology. And on the right side, I have an antibody named after me, Lynn Hirschman antibody that I worked on at Novartis. And this was the final room of the, of the eight room genetics lab that, um, that is ongoing. And a final one. Yeah, so this is called Shadow Stalker and um, it's about how we're being stalked digitally and how our digital profile is being sold to the highest bidder and how our digital profile has become the, the, the uh, most sought after commodity in the, in the world. And th this is a piece that you watch a 10 minute segment about the Red Square uh, attacking people essentially invisibly and causing all kinds of havoc and harm uh, to them and also the racial inequality of who gets targeted and how we don't know that this is happening, how the our uh, invisible uh, uh, 
um, traumas uh, are affecting our real life without our knowing about it, without the the material and information being true, and it really doesn't matter whether it is or not, and um, and bring and I did this week to bring, bring attention to this very dangerous um, uh, possibility that we're living with today. I think that's. Uh, yeah. That's thank enough. you. Thank you very much, Lynn. And now we'll move on to. Our, the next artist, uh, who is Tamako. Oh, there is one more, a couple more. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay, so this one I did uh, last year, the one before that, the blue one, I did with the Weiss Institute, not this one, it's the one before this. This was done with the Weiss Institute. And another thing that I thought was important was getting plastic out of water. And this is a piece that we did that actually did that. It opened at the new museum uh, in June. And it's done with, with something uh, with bacteria that nature created to actually eat plastic from water as well as from electrical pulses. And then the final one after this. This is called the Missing Person series. This is made by, by generated AI uh, images that scroll and create images of human beings that uh, don't exist. So there are literally like the wallpaper of the cat, there are millions of images of people that do not exist um, that are populating the world. And to me, this is kind of a sign of extinction, you know, that maybe we don't need humans anymore because uh, it's far cheaper to buy an image of a human than to uh, employ a real one. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we got those in as well. Thank you so much. And now, uh, our next our next artist uh, is Stephanie Dinkins, uh, and so I'll turn it over to Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and celebrate um, this wonderful new book. I'm excited to talk about my work. I will tell you that I started relatively recently looking at, you know, technology, especially artificial intelligence. And this is the question I started with. What does AI need from you? And this is really a question that I put forward to my neighbors here in Bedford Stuyvesant, in Brooklyn. Um, you know, the original image that you saw in the introductions was one of me talking to Bina48, one of the world's most advanced social robots that started a immense set of questions for me about the technological future and not only about the technological future but what that future would mean for communities of color black folks for my family right and how we needed to be working with and thinking about those technologies to see what could be done about living with them right um if if talking to bina 48 taught me anything it taught me that we will definitely be living with these technologies and perhaps collaborating with them and or even being hybrids with them so trying to figure out what we should do and that project in itself brought me to this question of you know well where do we go from here we are here we can't afford to just watch these technologies be produced around us and not participate in their making especially when they have such the potential for such impact in our lives um, so I started thinking about ways to intervene or ways to call attention to the systems and how they interact with communities of color. And what you're looking at here is a, a picture of an app that I've just released recently called Binary Calculations are inadequate to assess us. And you'll notice that my titles or and the questions I ask are often ones that even if there was no art attached would be questions I'd like to ask within the public. And with this app, we're trying to get people to define the world that they would love to see to help us create data sets that are more representative um, of, of folks of color um, that have greater, more nuanced ideas of who and what we are as a global community. And that can like fully describe something like this, which is uh, what, not the only one or a version of a project of mine called not the only one. That's really a composite version like this. I work in composites. I wanna know what we think 
collectively and how we want to build out the world collectively. Those are the things that are important to me. And I also try to work with community to decide what those ideas are. So I'm always building towards experimenting in. And really, I think it's an adventure in trying to figure things out because really I was trained as a photographer um, and someone who documents things. And in that idea of documenting, um, I set out on the adventure of also then, well, okay, I'm not just going to document, but what happens if I dabble in these spaces? And what's been amazing for me or, or in my trajectory for the past, what, six, seven, eight years has been how the questions that I've come up with through documenting ideas about communities I'm really concerned about by documenting through oral histories and using technology then to disseminate it, my family's history, how those questions have exceeded um, any expectations I could have for them and gone out into the world to ask questions of people who are actually creating the technologies, right? And, and in, in my explorations and research, you know, it, it comes down to the fact that the world that we live in right now is being built out in many ways by a very, um, a very constricted subsection of people and usually that's white men. And even if they have our best intentions in mind, um, it's very hard to them for them to build a world that is accepting and supportive and caring of most of the world. Um, and the question for me is then, how, how do we who sit on the edges, um, who uh, have been marginalized for years, or even those of us who are deep within the technological space and working at things, how do we start to impact the systems that have such great impact on us without being angry, without being just someone on the sidelines, but by adding our stories, um, our ways of being, our very particular knowledges to the great data set that, um, you know, becomes the structure of a lot of the infrastructure that we we rely on. And, and I will say in closing that the way I got here is that every time I try to do a project that is um, data dependent, or use a GAN, right, um, that we saw just a minute ago, right? To, to build a GAN of a Black woman is a really hard feat. And it's really because the data sets that are available to most systems that we're dealing with do not include enough images of folks like me to draw or create, you know, really clear, nuanced, contemporary images of who and what we are. And so my practice is about trying to fill in some of that um, information, um, even though that is a, a gargantuan, like it's a gargantuan task. And also, you know, challenge uh, the powers that be to do better. And my practice has really become, to my surprise, one of those spaces where um, I'm making things that seem to um, be on par with, you know, places like Stanford or Facebook in some ways in terms of natural language processing. And in doing so and talking to folks in those places, it challenges them um, to do the things that they've told me are not possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so now we move on to Tamako Teal. We have the first slide, please. So I started out as a, a product design engineer and this, uh, the connection machine was the last piece that I did with this technology. And when I was a graduate student in mechanical engineering at MIT, I hung out with the, mostly with the AI crowd. They had the best parties, but also I, I think seriously growing up as a, a child in, in Japan, that uh, the sort of AI mindset of, of wanting to create sentient machines uh, really struck a chord um, growing up in a culture that that's, can see as uh, inanimate objects uh, or whether in the West considered inanimate objects like stones or swords or machines to have the possibility of having uh, some sort of uh, uh, animated spirit or, or, or soul or, or, or spark in them. So when, when uh, my friend Danny Hillis said, hey, I'm going to uh, do a startup to 
uh, to actually build the supercomputer that I'm designing for my PhD thesis, can you do the product design for it? Then I was really excited uh, with this opportunity to see if I could really use the physical form and look of a machine to communicate this dream of artificial intelligence of creating sort of sentient machines. So the machine was inspired by the human brain in that it had uh, 64,000 plus very small processors, but very richly connected, as opposed to the supercomputers in those days, which had maybe at the most two or so processors. And a machine like Danny had designed was considered impossible to make. So uh, it turns out that the, uh, the machine um, was in 1989 the fastest in the world. It's a uh, hardware and software flowed into uh, Google's AI technology and um, you know how that is dominating uh, the field right now. So in order to con convey this, this feeling, um, we uh, made the doors of the machine translucent so that you could see the status lights connected to each of the processors. And so as the machine was calculating, you could program the lights so that it was showing you where the calculations were flowing. So the machine would really be communicating with you, talking with you, showing, it, uh, showing you its thinking process. Next slide, please. So in the mid nineties, I found myself in San Francisco and realized it was a time when uh, virtual reality, so interactive 3D computer graphics, for the first time was able to run on high-end PCs instead of the $100,000 and upwards workstations that were required just a year or two before. So I was hired as a producer and creative director at Worlds Incorporated to work with Steven Spielberg, then chairman of the Starbright Foundation, to create what was the first online 3D virtual reality world for children, Starbright World. And then Starbright Foundation deals with seriously ill children. In, and, and so we tried uh, to uh, improve their, the, the life that they would have when they were stuck in hospitals. And we were running Starbright World uh, between five US children's hospitals. Next, next slide, please. Spielberg was, of course, EP. So this idea of using um, uh, high tech, but using high tech that could be, so to speak, brought out to the masses stayed with me for uh, three very uh, large virtual um, uh, artworks that I created after that. The first one, Beyond Nansenar, done together with Sarah Kushman, is probably as far as I've been able to find out, the first virtual reality artwork that has been had been acquired by a US art museum. And please, I'd love to find out if this is wrong, but I haven't been able to turn up anything earlier. It was bought in 2002 by the San Jose Museum of Art in Silicon Valley. Lynn should know if there's anything else out there. So I really think of this as a virtual reality for the rest of us. At that point, VR, stereo were very poor. They would make you sick very quickly. And so I insisted on using one PC, one projector, a monoscopic uh, projection, not stereo, but a very large screen, nine feet tall, uh, 12 feet wide. And you're close enough so it fills your peripheral vision. It's a space that your body feels like it can walk into. And the whole thing run by a very simple joystick that can be used also by people who've lost the capacity in their hands, can be used by, by uh, US um, military veterans, because this is a, a piece about the, uh, the Japanese American historical incarceration of, of 120 um, uh, uh, men, women, and children uh, during World War II for the crime of having Japanese blood. And layered on top of that, the, the layer that Zara brought as an Iranian American, similar threats to intern them during the hostage crisis in 1979-80. Uh, I wanted to show it as broadly as possible. And at that point, VR could only be seen in about five institutions worldwide. So, so I got a lot of flack for using very simple hardware for instance, I found out years later that, uh, that uh, my, this piece was rejected by the Ars Electronica jury for interactive um, 
artworks because they said it's about innovation and interactivity. She's using a simple joystick. That's not innovative. So apparently the fact that I was dealing with a, a very deep content and that the interaction that for me was important was how the, the, the user in first person perspective interacted with the content, interacted with the software structure and these multiple spaces that the person would decide themselves what they went through. That was not important. Hardware was important. Next slide, please. And that's really a sort of a, a viewpoint that I've seen a lot from a male dominated tech world. It's about, it's, it's more about the hardware than anything else. So I started working with augmented reality in 2010, uh, participating in a guerrilla intervention into the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And then uh, the next year we had formed an artist group of uh, like-minded AR artists. And I led our intervention into the Venice Biennial in 2011. So, um, so in 2018, I got a, a, a commission from uh, Christiana Paul, the media art creator of the Whitney Museum to um, create a new piece for the very large uh, exhibit program that took, took over the sixth floor. Lynn was there uh, with, her, with one of her pieces. And um, it, we, my partner slash P and I decided we were going to put the Whitney underwater. So we put this beautiful coral reef on the sixth floor terrace and you're getting this burbling sound and there's this blue watery background. But if you look closely at these corals, you'll realize that they're made out of plastic garbage. So I'm trying to put your, your, the viewer in a first person's perspective into this environment to show people what it would be like to have to inhabit a world full of plastic like the plastic garbage that we're dumping into the waters. Next slide, please. There's a certain delay here, there we go. Okay, so um, next week I'm opening the Rewilder Commission for the Smithsonian Institution's 175th anniversary. And you know, the, the curators challenged us to imagine the future you want, not the future you fear. Very hard for me because I tend to be very cynical. But, um, but in talking with the Smithsonian Guards people, I, I decided I really wanted to uh, do this rewilding uh, concept, but focusing uh, um, uh, on not only the plants, but on the insects that are needed to propagate the plants, to pollinate the plants, and really emphasizing it's, it's not just beautiful butterflies that we love, but also all sorts of creepy crawly insects that that you know, bees that don't produce any honey, so they're no use to us. But the, these are all necessary parts of the whole ecosystem. We can't pick and choose and say, we're going to sterilize the world clean of the ones we don't like, and we're going to just uh, have the ones we do like, because then the whole world collapses. So Stephanie, I look forward to seeing uh, the piece that you're showing in this exhibit also, and, and really excited to to, uh, to, to, to use it and, and interact with it. So thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much for telling us all of this. And so now we turn to Mimi and we will hear from her. Hi everyone, it's really nice to be here. It's great to be in this group. I wanna talk a little bit about um, a sense of place or really who gets to have access to a sense of place. I wanna do that by talking about work that I made but before I get there. I have to begin with someone else's work, which is what I have here. So these are two prints from a series by Ingrid Pollard. Ingrid Pollard is a wonderful Black British um, or British Caribbean photographer. And this series is called Pastoral Interlude. It's from 1988. It's from before I was even born. Um, and yet it is a series that I have spent a lot of time with. The whole series shows photos of Black British people in nature. And it's in a time when the countryside and the idyllic leisure that it represented was not presumed to be available for them. And this is really what the whole, the whole series is about. And it's, it's hard to read the caption that she, uh, Ingrid Pollard puts under all of the images. So I'll read one of them out loud. And it says, it's as if the black experience is only lived within an urban environment. I thought I liked the Lake District where I wandered lonely as a black face in a sea of white. A visit to the countryside is always accompanied by a feeling of unease, dread. So in this series, Ingrid Pollard is talking about Brits in the 80s 
She's talking about the ways in which space itself was not open to everyone. And she's talking about this imaginary order that determines where people can move and how people are seen and who can go to which places. And so when she stages these people, these we should see this woman, when she stages these people in the countryside, she's doing this lovely act of revealing the logic, that logic by pushing against it. So that all the subjects within her work are, they're not out of place, but they're out of their imagined place. And what she's trying to show is that even though those might be imagined boundaries that govern where they can move, crossing them is still materially dangerous. So I wanna stay here for a minute just because the first time I saw this collection, I felt this really strong sense of recognition. But maybe because I'm a programmer, I felt this more in relationship to technology and to data. And at the time, I, I had been thinking a lot about the ways that Black suffering in general is typified and normalized so that it becomes something expected and unsurprising. And I was thinking about the countless reports that would detail the many injustices that we face and about these, the steady outpouring of, of images, data in the form of images of physical violence enacted against Black people, from violence at the border to anonymous tokenized starving children to victims of police brutality. And I was thinking and dwelling on how seeing this over and over, these, these types of image, these types of images uh, would begin to naturalize, naturalize that image, regardless of where you are. And how in those these moments, the presence of that data, the photograph becomes a kind of point in itself rather than an opportunity for change. So if you can move to the next slide, please. All of that thinking led me to creating a series of work, which um, I created this year, and it's called Natural, or Where Are We Supposed to Be? And this is, these are, which I'm going to show you, there's just three images in this series. They're all shot on film. Um, it's, no artist really works alone. I want to shout out to the people who helped me with this, Pablo Rohi and Tino Ade Oyelowo. And I'll just say each of these images is about three feet by four feet long. You won't be able to see that because I'm going to show you just a close up of each one. You can move to the next slide, please. So all of these images feature a woman in a server room. I think that you'll see that I'm very much in dialogue with Ingrid Pollard here, even though we're talking about different spaces. For people who aren't aware, server rooms are, are those places where data lives. It's where people who actually own data have access to it. All of us are creating data all the time, even this right now in this moment, we're doing it, but that doesn't mean that we all have the same level of access to it or control over it. And in many cases, being able, uh, people who own these servers, which is where so many of these data sets actually live, they're the ones who actually have the most power over them. And so in the series, I wanted to turn the tables and I wondered what it could, what it could do to visually depict someone within these spaces, in these spaces where so, so few of us are actually allowed to go, in these spaces where data is gathered and where it's owned. And you'll see, um, you can read on some of these, each of these images has a caption. This one says, places where our information matters more than we do. Could you move to the next, uh, next one, please? I want to stay with this idea of these server rooms just because it is such an interesting story. In, in an earlier moment of computing, many organizations and companies would have their own server rooms where they would host their data. Today, these are being shut down in favor of large, farm, large data farms owned by companies like Amazon. So it adds another layer to this work. This shoot was in one of those historic rooms here in New York City that was actually on the cusp of being shut down. Even getting access to this room became something that engaged with the very topic that the piece is talking about, about who has access to which space. And so it, it is a story for another day, really incredible the fact that I was able to even come into these spaces. And that reality meshed with the questions that the piece was asking and engaging with, this question of who has ownership, who has power, who has control. And these are, these are questions that so much of my work is always engaged with. Thank you so much. Last one. Thank oh, there's just one more still. Oh, okay, go ahead. This is the final, final image in the series. This features the same, same woman sitting in the center of the space. And I just want to, I said when I first began, I'm thinking about this question of place and of space. And I think that this is something that for me constantly comes up when I think about digital technologies, partly because 
there is a sense of these technologies as not being spatial and not being material. It's, it's easy to overlook that, thinking so much about the virtual. And even in the case in these digital technologies that do deal deeply with space, like thinking about mixed reality or augmented reality, there's still little attention paid to who is allowed to be in the underlying physical space that governs it. And I think that if, if anything, those, a lot of these technologies assume a kind of openness to space that just so rarely is the case, and at least not for everyone. And so in this work, I'm, there's something that I'm trying to, to make sense of, to weave together of these ideas, the city of place, of movement, of ownership and power. And I'm not really trying to disentangle it, but at least to sit with it and make sense of it. And I will, I'll leave this just on the last caption, this image, which says, steward, not subject. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for raising all these issues in your work and for giving such an interesting presentation. And last but not hardly least is Terry, uh, who is speaking to us, as she pointed out, from the future, because she's speaking from New Zealand, and it is actually Wednesday in New Zealand and a little bit after noontime. So Terry, uh, speak to us from the future. Uh, Judy. Uh, kia ora everybody. Uh, my name is Terry Teto. I am an artist uh, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I am Pākehā on my mother's side and Māori on my father's side from an iwi or tribe called Ngāti Kahungunuki Wairarapa Rangitāne Hoki. So um, I'm feeling very excited uh, and humbled to be presenting with you incredible artists today. And um, thank you, Judy, for inviting me. Um, so the work that I want to share with you today is called Te Aho Te Hau Ki Te Papa Ioia. And it's, uh, I made it in 2013. It's a reflection on a police investigation that happened in Aotearoa in 2007, where police raided the homes of around uh, 60, over 60 um, predominantly Māori activists. And uh, it included our home, the home I was living in with my husband and children at the time. And uh, the investigation followed a period of around a year and a half of surveillance and was conducted under the Terrorism Suppression Act. So this was the lens through which all of our activities and data were viewed through. Um, this terrorist narrative was really shocking for our communities. And um, for me and a lot of people, I think it really raised questions around um, what we often assume to be empirical data um, that is gleaned from surveillance evidence and how susceptible that is to prejudice and racism. Um, this was something as well that was highlighted for us in um, two, oh, 2019 when the Christchurch terrorist attack happened on Muslim communities here on mosques where 51 people died. And it was revealed then that in 10 years of state surveillance, um, not once had there been a mention of white supremacy. And so this was in really stark contrast to the huge, huge amount of resources that were put into finding terrorists within Maori activists. So uh, yeah, um, I chose to make a work that reflected on this and um, the research was really underpinned by um, a proverb that we have, it's quite a well-known Māori proverb, he kōkonga ngā kau e, um, he kōkonga whare e kitea, he kōkonga ngā kau e kore e kitea, which means um, you can see the corners of a person's house, but not so the corners of a person's heart. And so this is a surveillance vehicle. Um, oh, if you want to switch the slide, that would be cool. Um, so it sits within a gallery space and visitors are invited to sit inside and watch as the vehicle navigates the town I was living with, uh, I, I was living in at the time and passes by the four uh, houses that were raided, including our own. Um, the van is calibrated to capture the unseen qualities of the heart that's referred to in that proverb. Um, and these qualities that I've, I've imagined to be ho, which is a Māori concept and something described by scholar Hidini Mukomid as being um, coloured rays emanating off the body that encapsulate personality and also linger for a long time after people have left. And so um, 
and also within that is uh, concepts that talk about the way people interact and relationships with each other. So the first iteration of this van showed a different film, um, which included uh, data being uh, captured by the van as it went through a small town and uh, was illustrated through really cheesy kind of heads up displays that we see in science fiction movies, but that um, uh, an interface between the viewer and their environment. And so as the van progressed, the data on screen increased until the contextual information of the landscape was obscured. And so um, in this film, it's also a type of visual surveillance, but a kind of fictional, um, uh, fictional sort of idea of how, um, I guess of intangible elements or qualities um, as opposed to a detached observer as thinking about this idea of how and internal qualities that are revealed through people's relationships. Um, oh, if you want to switch to the next slide. Um, so that's the, um, a still of the first film. And um, just lastly, to finish off, um, if you want to go to the next slide. I just wanted to quickly touch on the process for making this work because um, on one hand, it's really satisfying for me to see the beginning <laughs> and then the end product of the beautifully painted van, but also that um, uh, it made me think a lot about how projects can give access to certain spaces in a small way, drawing on what you were saying, Mimi, um, to certain spaces. Uh, so for this, I was able to cut a deal with a friend of a mate um, to work in the panel, their panel beater shop and um, pay for the time that they spent teaching me, but also for use of the space. But um, tradey environments are notoriously rough places to work in. And I often had to psych myself up to go in there, even though they were super tolerant of me being in there, of having a weirdo artist working within the space. Um, it was something that was also quite challenging um, and is something that I want to, and I have, tried to continue to incorporate into my art practice. Because um, although it's hard, it's, it's super interesting and a really, a really great learning thing, I think. So um, yeah, that's me. Um, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to our discussion and it's really amazing to meet you all. Um, Namahi nui, tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you so much, Terry, and thank you everybody um, for hitting on so many of the topics that uh, made this book so exciting for me to work on. Uh, and I have to say that when I started uh, working on this, um, I didn't realize the extent to which uh, women artists using digital technology were changing the nature of technology and making us think about the content and what we could do with it, rather than thinking about um, advancements in hardware as, as Tamiko pointed out. Um, so it just became absolutely evident to me and it was very exciting to, to learn that. Um, and you can see that the artists here and then also the artists, all of the artists in my book, um, they're working on these issues that are absolutely crucial to us from race to science, to big data, to government surveillance, to what it is to be human. So I, what is lovely now is that we can have a little bit of an informal conversation and I'm gonna start with a question, um, but the conversation will go in whatever directions um, everyone wants it to go in. So what I, I wanted to ask was the impact that you think digital art, particularly feminist digital art, can have in relation to the power politics that seems to be taking over the world and creating such disparity and inequality. Digital art has the potential to reach, reach vast audiences rather than an elite and limited museum going audience. And can uh, art like this, feminist, using uh, digital technology influence human behavior? And does it have more influence than traditional art forms? So I open it up for discussion, but you can talk about um, other aspects of, of you know, issues that have been raised. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in what you think, particularly since this is an international group, what you think about the status of women identified trans and non-binary um, uh, people um, uh, in your countries in terms of culture. Um, do they understand that 
feminism um, is a movement on behalf of all humanity. It's a way of the future, not a word from the past. So these are all the kinds of issues that I thought we might have some discussion about. Who would like to, who would like to lead off? I, I can speak to the um, technologies that I've been using, virtual reality and, and augmented reality, you know, from the mid 90s and from 2010, that the, the reason I was interested in using them was because of their ability to put the, uh, the viewer in, uh, in an active role. And so they're not, uh, they're not passively consuming um, the, you know, the created artwork, but their participation is necessary. And, but their participation is done from a first person perspective so that you can really put someone in the middle of a situation. So I saw very much both these technologies as, as being, uh, being something that could hopefully uh, uh, enable people to put themselves, see themselves in different roles and experiencing things in different ways than, than they were normally doing. So yes, it was very much a, uh, I hope that these new technologies could help um, a broaden understanding between uh, between genders, between races, between cultures. Lynn, I think you're talking. Lynn, I think you're talking. Lynn, I, you're, mute. you're on mute. Okay, I think the pan, can you hear me now? Yes. We yes. The pandemic you. has shown us how crucial uh, connectivity is. And that's one thing that we have with uh, participation and understanding our power through the participation on a global scale and being able to interact beyond a small community. But I think right now, you know, that, that it's kind of a tie between who's, who's really controlling us and how are we controlling uh, being controlled. One thing I was thinking about lately was that the, the cyborg was invented by NASA. And it was the, it was the National uh, Space Aeronautics um, uh, Agency. And, and af that was 60 years ago. So the cyborgs right now is 61 years old and the progeny have happened you know, through DARPA and through other war-based war systems that have the ability for assault and surveillance at a grand scale. So I think we really have to come to terms with the, with the possibilities of cyborgian futures because without humans, they won't exist either. So we really have to find a way in the world to uh, partner with the planet and to partner with technology so that we can really have, have an enhanced and even a future. Anyone else? Um, well, let me ask another. Let me ask another question, which has to do with um, the fact that we now have the whole world of this virtual world of the economy with cryptocurrency, and we have the emergence of NFTs, um, non fungible tokens, which are related to this new um, digital world of the economy. And um, you know, just to make sure that people know what an NFT is, it's, uh, I, I'm a printmaker. And so I see it as a form in a sense of a limited edition print, but instead of being a physical thing, it's a copyrighted piece of code that does produce a physical thing, um, but that is uh, copyrighted so that um, it can't be, re it re be repeated. And so its uniqueness gives it the kind of value that, it, that a unique piece of art has. Um, so my question really has to do with um, the, the, whether we are going to move into a virtual world, whether the virtual world is one that we live in more than we do in the physical world, the world away from the keyboard at the moment, is are we moving in a direction where we all become um, you know, involved in what used to be a science fiction world, if you will, but that could be the world of the future. That was kind of a lot of things in that. So wherever, wherever you want to take it. I can, I can jump in. Um, 
Hmm, maybe I'll tie, try to tie those two, the two questions together and start by saying that I think, I don't know if there is one virtual world or one physical world. I think both are full of lots of different contexts that we slide in and out of a lot of them. Um, depending on the moment, depending on where we are, I think there are more opportunities for con contextual collapse across online spaces and that that is what results in a lot of the tensions that, that we see. But fundamentally, they're all, it's all multitudes. And I think that kind of connects to the last question, which is, I know, did I? Which is just, it's interesting thinking about digital art or media art, any, all the different terms that we use for this, this work that has to do with emerging technologies. All of it really came out of the same conditions that created the tech sector. It's the same military, I mean, Lynn was already talking about this a bit. It's, it's the same military industrial com uh, complex, but also the, that same like nerdy academic culture and then this governmental funding and also very strong idealism about creating a better world while also being very limited to a pretty small group of people. Stephanie talks about this too. So I think that there's these, what is very interesting to me, thinking about tech in general are all these contradictions. There's this like desire for clear openness, but also <laughs> this strange kind of supporting of the mainstream or following prominent mates of how things have already worked for a while, which is just to say that I think that complication is very good because there's space for it for things to to subvert um, whatever the mainstream map is. But I also say that that will never happen just uh, unless it's extremely intentional. Well, I think the question is, I see I see all of you as as subverting that, you know, subverting that patriarchal connection. And so um, the question is, can it how 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 much impact can it have? Can, can, as artists, do you feel that it's possible to bring about change in the way, in the patriarchy and have the patriarchy be um, dis, um, dismantled in order to allow for a different kind of human-centered um, society? Um, I, I'll, I'll jump in there a little bit. I, I think, you know, to do the work I, I do, I have to believe that there's that opportunity, right? Or at least that it, it's possible. Like what, what's probable is a different story. Um, though I feel like there are ways in which we can make small dents. And I'm always actually baffled by the dents that I feel like the dents that I've been able to make, right? I always feel like I'm just, I'm, I'm no one. I'm a person playing in this technological field and playing and their dents been made, right? And that's really interesting to me, how far they go or what the ripple does. Like I like to think of a Doppler effect when you throw something and maybe there's a small ripple, um, but complete dismantling, I don't know. I don't know that we're ready, right? Um, that we're ready as a society to really move forward and do the things necessary to dismantle, but I'm hopeful, right? I was listening to a show about hope and how without hope, we have nothing to go on. And so it's my hope and the way that I keep doing what I do is that I'm hopeful that, yeah, there's something that can happen and that I can talk to others and say, well, if you do something, there's a possibility that it too might be a, a pinprick that makes a modicum of change, but I'm a protopian, like small changes that, you know, have small impacts and going on and on. And so, yeah, I, I have to, I have to believe that that's possible in some way, shape or form. Right. Well, I think that we're, we're coming close to the end of our time together. So um, I, if there are some questions uh, from the audience, um, perhaps we can take a couple of those at the moment. Yeah, and I encourage folks to put them in the chat or use the raise hand function and I will unmute you. So Abby, are you going to read the questions? When they appear, yes, but oh. there hasn't been any, but I do see Diane Burko is raising her hand. I'm gonna to ask to unmute Diane. All right, I unmuted myself. Um, this is fascinating. I first wanna thank all of you participants. You are amazing women. I mean, there's just so much to uh, think about uh, in, in the work that you're all doing. Um, and I think it's hopeful, very, very hopeful. And I think you guys are doing more than making a few dents. Um, and my question is to all of you who are in these disparate parts of the world, 
Um, I'm just curious to know, with all your international uh, connections and knowing Judy Brodsky's interest in feminism and how important she was for the feminist art movement, is there a feminist art movement or a feminist movement that you guys are connected to in New Zealand, for instance, or Berlin? I'm, I'm just curious about that, your community. Um, I could talk a little bit about a related but really different concept um, for an Aotearoa context. We have, um, a, it's, kind of, it's a thing we call mana wahine, which is um, a Māori concept around um, mana, which means um, power, power, but it's not the kind of power that um, is harmful in a society or in the kind of patriarchal sense. It's a power that... Um, yeah, it doesn't cause harm in, in society. So that um, concept is put next to um, idea of wahine, um, which means which means woman. But uh, mana is also creative energy. So um, mana wahine is really about enabling spaces for women to be able to fulfill that potential, but also recognizes that potential needs to be filled across genders and, and across uh, different cultural groups and ethnicities. Um, so it's it's related to feminism, but it's a little bit different. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else out there in Berlin, for instance? Or I know Lynn knows a lot about that stuff. <laughs> I think your time too, Diana. I might ask let another couple of folks answer because we've just got a little over five minutes. So Ferris, I see your hand, and then we will get to Sarah's question in the chat. So Ferris, I'm going to ask to unmute. So you're still muted. You have to click. I can't unmute you, but I can ask. There okay. We go. okay. Yep. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, Judy, for putting together this amazing panel. Um, I've been reading a lot about NFTs, and uh, you're working with what would be considered cutting edge art medium, so to speak, non traditional, as we art historians think about art in general. Um, and I'm just wondering what your experiences are with collectors and museums. Um, and I also noticed, I think in the last week, an article talking about how women artists working with NFT are valued much less than the male counterparts. So why is that? It's a new, it's a brand new medium. Why does it, why do we start out in, a, in an unequal level of things? Maybe you could explain. <laughs> yeah, I think I can say something to that. I mean, if you look at uh, at the top selling. Uh, nifties it's very much um yeah it's very much boy club art and um and the uh the, and that's be because the the people who have made vast fortunes in cryptocurrencies are also um it, it's also a certain uh, sort of certain type of male so they're attracted to certain types of of art that might be very misogynist and, and racist and uh and and, uh, and and so the there's a tremendous potential in the technology of, of nifties and of blockchains but what's happening right now in terms of power money and influence is that it's all the same sort of uh, boys club and um you know i've i've participated in in in, in nifties in, in some way that i'm very my participation in the christies was to say uh, I'd, I'd love to do this but you're using a blockchain that causes tremendous environmental damage I'll only participate if you can help me find a way to uh, to uh, use uh, the types of uh, proof of stake blockchain that have minimal damage and so uh, they they went along with that and and the company monograph that was uh, doing the technology um, developed a process by which I could then mint on a, uh, on a, um, on a, uh, on a proof of stake blockchain. But, you know, there's lots of pe people I know who are saying, hey, I've been a poor artist all my life. This is my chance to make money. I don't, I don't care what the ramifications are. And because I make art with an environmental theme, if I went along uh, with this uh, environmentally damaging uh, initiative blockchain <laughs> that would devalue my art. So, so it's, you know, it's, it's own, I was able to push and, and get the system to change slightly, 
but um, but there's just a, there's a lot of people also like you know black and people of color saying hey this is a chance for me to like make lots of money and am I going to just sit here and say no no you know the the white guys should be the ones making the money because we're we're poor and stuff um, you, you can't you can't say that you can't you can't say that that's you know you can't sort of force someone to to turn down that chance but. Right now, it's duplicating the existing power structures in a different group of people. And so there's a lot of work to be done there. I'm talking with, uh, with the I-Beam um, uh, Art Center in, in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, we're in discussions that Judy is also getting involved in about how can we use this technology, so to speak, for good and not for evil to foster uh, foster more of the type of world we want to, but it's a lot of work and the momentum is behind um, the same sort of power structures, the same sort of, you know, uh, male, male dominated, uh, we're going to like break the world and uh, don't care if we do. Thank you, Tommy. I appreciate it. Thank you. We have time for, I think, one or two more. And Sarah had an important question about accessibility. So Sarah, I'm going to un ask to unmute you. And then I did, um, Linda, we'll make sure to make time for your question. We might go over just a minute or two, but I want to make sure we hear from folks. So Sarah. Perfect. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here, especially as a self-taught artist. Um, I'm excited to learn. And one of the things that I'd love if we could address is what I kind of see is a current accessibility issue as it relates to the book, um, because unfortunately, I was really surprised that none of Judith Brodsky's work seems to be available, like none of her work currently seems to be available on any online library apps, for example, including this new gem of a book. And independent bookstores that I've reached out to can't order this book and even if they could it is pretty darn expensive and okay. accessibility yeah i believe relates to providing people with education for dismantling and de decolonizing things and so like i would love for your work and everyone's work to be more accessible yes i think that's a really good point and thank you for raising it and uh apparently there's a there's several things that are involved in this. One is that um, there is a supply chain problem, so there, there are no books available at the moment. And so um, they, they've now asked me um, what they should do, and they're going to have a shipment in, uh, sometime in November and then another shipment in December. And I said, fill all the, the pre-orders, you know, because people have been waiting for months, you know, for the book. I didn't have any books till a few days ago. And finally, I got an author's copy of the book. So I hadn't seen it myself. And I know it's really, I, I have to say that I think all of you as panelists were just wonderful. Considering you haven't seen the book either, you know that you were able to address issues that I raised in the book. But um, there, and, and the other thing is that uh, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I didn't realize that the paperback was not going to come out at the same time as the hardcover. And, and the hardcover is out and there is also an electronic um, uh, version that's available, but that is also uh, quite expensive at the moment. However, I did ask Bloomsbury to offer a 35% discount. That's as much as they could go. Um, and so there is a discount that's available to everybody who's signed up for this um, program. Uh, the other thing is that there will be a paperback and I have been assured uh, they ordinarily don't bring the paperbacks out for a full year. And I pleaded and I said, you know, please, could you get the paperback out? This is not a book that's intended, you know, for just an elite audience. It's really a book that I intended for general public to understand this whole area, this whole field of digital art. So there, in, in, in just a few months, there will be a paperback, I'm glad to say, which will then be much more possible for people to acquire. But in the meantime, if you do have a few extra bucks, the artists in the book are fabulous, as you just found out. 
And um, if you can afford it, um, then I would urge you to go on the Bloomsbury website and use the and use the um, discount that's available, which brings it down into you know beginning to approach you know, something that's that's reasonable. But I completely you. agree with you. Oh, thank you so much, Judy, for that. And we dropped a link in the chat, so everyone should have access to those that discount and that. Thank you for that great question, Sarah. All right, last. But not least, Linda, I'm going to ask you to unmute and then you've got the last question of the night before we say goodbye. Hi, can can you see me and hear me? Yes. OK, because somehow I lost my Zoom window, so I can't see anyone. <laughs> um, I just was curious. I noticed some of you. And by the way, I'm Linda Goodman. Hi to those I know. Um, I noticed that some of you are 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 uh, affiliated with some schools and others are obviously independent artists. And um, with this question of the patriarchy and the, the uh, um, dominance of the, the military, I was wondering if, if you're getting the word out uh, it, by either having shows or working with students at other institutions. I do have a couple of nephews at MIT and Stanford who seem pretty woke, but they're they're you know they're in AI and computers and all that. Um, so I'm just curious since it is, you know, I heard there's hope. Um, I'm wondering if 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 there's if you see something in in that realm, uh, educationally or communication or collaboration with the young men and women working in those fields, whether they're artists or not. Could I just uh, interrupt while people are thinking about that for a minute, which is when the paperback comes out, buy the paperback and give it to your, give it to those young men. That will help. I, I can definitely say something to that. Um, I operate on many levels in many places. Um, which is a little bit crazy, but for instance, right now I'm setting up a lab at Stony Brook University called the Future Histories Lab. And it's all about inviting um, not only people in the academy into the art department to think about whether they do it through making or writing or coding, um, you know, what futures we're trying to create with these technologies, but also people just from communities that we care about. Like, I don't think I can limit it to um, the, the academy. And actually, I try to go under the radar in my academy. So I get to do things in a broader, more open fashion. Um, and that lab is related to something called the Disco Network, which is related to... Um, what are we? Uh, U Michigan, Purdue, Georgia Tech, um, University of Maryland. And so we're this network that is trying to really do this work in um, our own institutions, but then amongst each other and open doors and pathways to other folks. And I'll also say that I'm someone who finds themselves working within um, institutions that I'm not related to as artists in residence, as Mimi does, I think, um, now and again. And that's an interesting in spot to be in because as woke as people can be, um, still, when I walk into like a Stanford's computer science department as a black woman and challenge that it's an interesting conversation that ensues. Um, and, and I love that. I, I, I love that value, that conversation and think it's really important. Um, but at the same time, I will say like when I was at Stanford, I was frightened by the neoliberal um, take on what needs to be done and how, um, how, tunnel vision that seemed to be. And so I think there are lots of conversations we have to be having from many different directions with many different constituencies. Um, I think so that's you, a wonderful place to end because I think you're absolutely right. And we were all working on it. Uh, and I'm gonna turn this back to Abby to bring it to a close. And I just wanna thank our participants so much and thank all of you who attended. Um, it's really been a wonderful evening. Abby? No, and a huge thank you to you, Judy. Thank you for making this happen and bringing this amazing group together to celebrate your book. It's been a pleasure. I hope to see all of you again soon. Check out our calendar and check out all the amazing things these artists are doing. And until then, stay safe and take care. Bye, everyone.